Now let's talk about the chapter 2 of alien law that is shock and blood transfusion. First of all, we must know the definition of shock. Now shock is a systemic state of low tissue perfusion that is inadequate for normal cellular respiration. So due to this no decreased cellular respiration, the body will switch to anaerobic mechanism which will produce lactate and even if even then glucose run out then the ATP generation is halted and then all the tissue death cell death ensues now as I said in cellular that happens in microvascular state it causes injury to the endothelial cells and leads to tissue edema in cardiovascular it causes reduced uh, preload and the systemic vascular resistance increases as a result of compensation except in the distributed shock and in respiratory due to metabolic acidosis the compensatory uh, respiratory alkalosis occurs due to increased respiration and the kidney supply is re reduced so there is decreased urine output and further in order to regain the sodium and water the urine output decreases next we got to know about the important fact that is ischemia reperfusion syndrome it means if there is a uh, time period of ischemia then if even if the perfusion is restored then the damage to the tissue occurs now why is that is because after some time has elapsed after the uh, injury let's say then the uh, various toxins such as maybe the potassium from the tissue gets released and that potassium and lactic acid causes myocardial depletion, systemic vasodilation and that leads to reperfusion injury as well as other mediators which are released like uh, cytokines and neutrophils these also are released into the circulation and these may go and attack the lungs leading to acute lung injury and maybe lead to renal shutdown or acute renal failure. Now we move to the classification of shock. The important point is we have to read is hypovolemic, cardiogenic, distributive, and then we have obstructive shock. And endocrine is a combination of these shocks. In hypovolemic shock, we have either hemorrhagic or non hemorrhagic. In non hemorrhagic, we have due to either vomiting, diarrhea, either uh, sweat loss, burn, or it may be due to third space loss that is mainly occurs in intestinal obstruction or pancreatitis. Next we have is the cardiogenic shock which is due to inability of the heart to pump that is occurred due to myocardial infarction, arrhythmia or valvular dysfunction or cardiomyopathy. Sometimes endogenous toxin like sepsis may also lead to the uh, cardiogenic shock as you will see sepsis leads to a lot of variety of shock at once and an obstructive shock there is something that is uh, preventing the proper feeling of the heart it might be the right heart or the left heart or left side of the heart so it might be due to cardiac tamponade it might be due to tension pneumothorax it might be due to pulmonary embolism or air embolus next is the distributive shock it is different than the other shock in other there is reduced um, increase vascular resistance but in distributive shock the vascular resistance rather decreases and cardiac output rather increases and it is mainly caused by the septic shock anaphylactic or neurogenic shock in anaphylactic it is due to histamine which causes vasodilation in spinal shock or neurogenic shock it is due to a loss of the catecholamines or sympathetic activation and in septic shock there is due to the endotoxin but as I said in later in septic shock due to tissue loss of fluid loss into the tissues there might be hypovolemia next is endocrine shock in endocrine shock it may generally due to hypothyroidism or adrenal insufficiency so hypothyroid is like it has a permissive effect on steroids and catecholamines due to which their effect cannot be done so it leads to the um, shock state in hyperthyroidism there is high output shock in adrenal insufficiency there is shock due to hypopolemia and pure response of the catecholamines 
now uh, differentiating this the important fact is in distributive shock the cardiac output increases and vascular resistance decreases which is opposite in all of those the mixed venous pressure that is uh, venous pressure sorry is the pressure in the uh, venous system that is increased only if the heart cannot pump so the, this occurs in cardiogenic and obstructive shock and uh, hypovolemic state causes low venous pressure as evidenced by the increased ABP in cardiogenic and obstructive shock and mixed venous oxygen saturation is the amount of oxygen that is present in the venous system that shows whether adequate oxygen has been consumed by the uh, peripheral tissue so if the peripheral tissue are consuming oxygen well then it is low as seen in hypovolemic cardiogen and obstructive shock but in sep distributive or septic shock the tissues cannot utilize oxygen properly as well as there is shunting of blood arteriovenous shunting so the blood flows without giving it off its oxygen to the tissues therefore the mixed venous oxygen saturation is high base deficit is high in all of this because of the production of lactic acidosis now the severity of shock can be defined as compensated and decompensated shock compensated shock means the body is able to compensate for the losses using various uh, catecholamines, means increasing the heart rate increasing stroke volume and vasoconstriction so the blood supply is directed towards the essential organs from the non-essential organs uh, next though the compensation occurs the blood supply to the gut muscles and skin is reduced therefore after if this continues this occult hypertension means the occult shock that is perfusion is restored to the essential organs like brain kidney lungs etc but it is not restored to the these organs then occult type perfusion occurs leading to ischemia reperfusion injury decompensation means if more than 30 to 40 percent of blood loss occurs then body cannot cope up at all even if we administer fluids at that time it is useless now grading of decompensation would be mild moderate and severe in mild first there is tachycardia and tachypnea the urine output tries to be maintained uh, slightly decreased and patient may have some anxiety in moderate the urine output decreases and blood pressure also slightly falls and in severe shock the patient is completely comatose sometimes or unconscious with labor respiration with no urine output and profound hypotension so the cl clinical features we can examine as lactic acidosis will be present in all but it will be severely increasing and in compensated everything else will be normal with slight tachycardia as we have mild shock we have tachycardia and tachypnea and in moderate we have decreased urinary output with drowsy consciousness with only mild hypotension in super we have severe hypotension with labor breathing comatose with absolutely no urine output now the consequences of shock we move on to the resuscitation and in this we see that the most important part of resuscitation is fluid therapy because airway and breathing are generally not compromised if it is then we have to look at that first and in fluid therapy the most important part is we must not give inotrope or chronotropic agent before fluid because if the heart is empty and if we give that then heart will try to pump more and then the myocardium supply of oxygen will also be lost and then we will induce further damage that is they, they will go into the unresuscitable stage because the coronary perfusion is decreased because it depends upon the diastolic filling time hence first is the fluid so that is done to the wide pore catheter and that is the important question why wide pore catheter is used on the periphery and not centrally even though we may think central line is closer to the heart the peripheral lines are we are thought to provide 
faster uh, fluid resuscitation because it is wider and length is low so the uh, resistance of this according to physics is less therefore we use peripheral lines so the type of fluid there is a huge debate between crystallites and colloids so the since colloids have expensive and more risks we must use crystalloids but blood is the first choice if it is available because it crystallites and colloids cannot provide oxygen we must never provide hypotonic solution like dextrose because even though if it is isotonic in the packet inside the body it will be utilized and it will be hypotonic and we will give only water so if there is only water loss like diabetes insipidus then we must give dextrose otherwise never because it cannot expand the volume properly it will go into the tissues and cause edema again now important thing is to know is whether patient respond to the fluid or not these are classified into three by giving the fluids to 50 to 500 ml over 5 to 10 minutes non responders means they do not respond at all means they are continuously breathing the fluid given is not enough and transient response means they respond for some time like the vital parameters improve for some times but they go back haywire that means there is some moment of bleeding going on or responders mean they have dramatic improvement to the fluids so for those whom fluid is not enough we must give vasopressor or inotropes vasopressor mainly for distributing shock which we mainly use is phenylephrine and noradrenaline while in cardiogenic shock we use uh, the inotropes mainly first line is dobutamine so the monitoring which is essential is essential monitoring is heart rate that can be done through ECG next is oxygen saturation next is blood pressure and urine output this is must invasive PP and central venous pressure yeah. are more required in if there is cardiogenic shock and we can also measure for that cardiac output and best if it's serum lactate so CBP measures is there is no fixed point of that uh, we should look at the response by giving the same fluid as mentioned before 250 to 500 ml over 5 to 10 minutes and the normal response is rise of 2 to 5 centimeter of water and it should be sustained over 10 to 20 minutes and return back if it doesn't come to that increase that then the fluid is not enough if it is increased more it might be cardiogenic shock so we must keep less fluids so now uh, how do we know systemic and organ perfusion is we uh, look at the brain perfusion to the consciousness level and kidney perfusion to the urine output but uh, our endpoint is perfusion of GI muscle and skin as well and these are seen through the mix um, mainly through the mixed venous oxygen saturation and lactic acidosis through lactate and base deficit so so mixed venous oxygen saturation is the percentage saturation of oxygen returning to the heart so it measures oxygen delivery and extraction the normal level is 50 to 70 percent if the tissue is extracting more in like no, uh, shock like hypovolemic and cardiogenic it will be less than 50 because whatever oxygen is creating the tissue will extract but in septic shock it will be greater than 70 because the tissue will not be able to extract oxygen so the end point of resuscitation no, it, traditionally it was normal blood pressure normal uh, pulse and normal urine output but this will lead to occurred hypoperfusion and it has a high mortality rate so we must look at the thing we can measure is global perfusion status which is measured through the lactate and mixed venous oxygen saturation that is it about shock in chapter 2 next we move to the MRS uh, MRS is quite easy uh, the thing we must know in embrace is embrace leads to a lethal triad known as um, which consists of three factors that is hypothermia acidosis and coagulopathy and this leads to trauma induced coagulopathy so the trauma leads to fibrinolysis and inflammation leading to coagulopathy and this shock state there is also if we transfuse the cold fluids it will lead to hypothermia and it will lead to coagulopathy again and again dilution of the blood by using crystalloids or packed red blood cells without uh, giving the FFP will lead to coagulopathy so 
that is an important point in this other our simple definition like primary reactionary and secondary hemorrhage primary means within 24 hours now in primary means within immediately you research reactionary means within 24 hours the reactionary hemorrhage generally occurs because in anesthesia the blood pressure is low and after a patient comes out of anesthesia the blood pressure normalizes and it leads to the breakage of ligature and from the bleeding bleeding occurs and also the slippage of ligature also leads to reactionary hemorrhage and secondary hemorrhage is mainly due to infection and erosion of the vessels uh, the degree of hemorrhage has uh, uh, little value so the management of hemorrhage is first we must identify where the bleeding is occurring from and we must research it at one once but the research station does not mean if we, the patient is bleeding inside the abdomen there is absolutely no use of giving fluids to stabilize the patient before going to the surgery the patient should be immediately prepared for surgery and surgery and research station must be gone in, in hand previously it was thought that we must research it before going to surgery but the use of crystalloids or even blood for that matter will not help if the patient is bleeding so stopping the bleeding is the first point and that can be done to various either through surgery endoscopy or angiography and so the concept is called damage control surgery which is means you must control bleeding prevent sepsis and protect from further injury then close the patient if you have something more to do we will do that in a later time and damage control resuscitation means it is it includes the damage control surgery but and it includes that as i have said if there is trauma there is a trauma induced coagulopathy so you, we must anticipate that and treat that if we are giving fluids too much we must anticipate hypothermia and we must try to prevent it and we must you give permissive hypotension if there is hemorrhage going on if you give too much fluids and try to resuscitate it, it cannot occur because the pressure increase means it will lead to more hemorrhage so we must try to keep the pressure low so that the bleeding vessel does not bleed too much and so for transfusion next we move to the transfusion which includes various history which is not required the blood products available are whole blood whole blood is generally not used not but it is useful because it contains the uh, clotting factors next is the back red blood cells and it is now stored in SAGM SAGM which includes saline adenine glucose and mannitol previously CDPA solution was used which includes citrate and phosphate dextrose and adenine which are a short shelf life up to two three weeks but sagam solution can last for five weeks ffp can last for two years used in coagulopathy cryoprecipitate has only factor eight which is the precipitate of ffp and fibrinogen platelets are used if there is platelet deficiency and it has short life shelf life of only, only five days prothrombin complex concentrate contains prothrombin that is factor two 9 and 10 on also factor 7 can be added and this is useful for warfarin toxicity because these are the vitamin k dependent coating factors and autologous blood is for a patient uh, three weeks before the surgery you can give the blood and it can be given during the time of surgery and it can also be collected during surgery and given back to the patient previously in every case we used to do blood transfusion but now the indication is only three if there is blood loss and we have to resuscitate the patient and if there is perioperative anemia and it cannot withstand surgery if there is a chronic anemia but it, the level is quite low so the trigger is generally considered to be less than six gram per deciliter uh, the next uh, we must know is the complication of blood transfusion all those are easy the complication of blood transfusion includes from single transfusion most important is incompatibility ABO incompatibility is likely fatal and it is called transfusion reaction sometimes there will be RH incompatibility if the patient has already been transfused before next is febrile reaction which occurs due to the WBC and allergic reaction may occur infection may be spread the mainly bacterial infection like malaria can be spread HIV hepatitis B and C can be spread and other like air embolism thrombophytis and transfusion related acute lung injury is a severe complication which results from mainly FFP due to the coding factors now from massive transfusion why this occurs is due to uh, the stored blood the rbc releases is died 
ties and then releases potassium so hyperkalemia can occur the phosphate binds with calcium so the calcium level decreases in the stored blood the stored blood is cold leads to hypothermia and the coagulation factor are deficient in packed red blood so it leads to coagulopathy so when we transfuse the red blood cell it is if you want to prevent coagulopathy then we must use uh, one pack of rpc along with one pack of platelets and one pack of face frozen plasma that will reduce the in this incidence of digestional coagulopathy that's it the substitutes are in development and not used right now